Hi, it's Carol Fitzgerald from readinggroupguides.com, a website from the Book Report Network and the host of the Book Reporter Talks to a Video podcast series. And I want to welcome you to our fifth Bocaccino Live book group event, where our guest this evening is Julie Clark, the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Last Flight. And I want you to note, this book was an instant New York Times bestseller in both hardcover and in paperback when it came out a couple of weeks ago. We have gotten so many notes from readers over the last year from people who love this book. I opened notes and they were just like, I love this book. I cannot believe this book. I want to talk about this book. And we have all burning questions that we want to ask Julie tonight. So the format for tonight is going to be as follows. Let me start by we noting that we are assuming that everyone who's on board tonight has read the book, okay? Because we're going to talk spoilers. So we're going to assume that you've read the book. If you haven't, you're going to have to close your ears or disappear, finish the book, and watch this on video later. I will begin with a discussion with Julie with a few members of the audience joining us live to share their questions. Those of you who have been with us before, you know this format. And I have some questions that have been submitted by readers who can't join us tonight. And then we're gonna take questions from the audience as well, from the Q&A. So as the evening goes on, if you have a question, drop it into the Q&A down below, which will be shared only with the panelists. So we wanna get to as many questions as we can. And so with that housekeeping behind us, let's welcome Julie to the stage. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm really good. You know, I was thinking as pulling together back in January 2020, which seems yeah. like three lifetimes ago, yeah. you and I were at Winter Institute, at the American Booksellers Association, Winter Institute, and your publisher brought me over and said, you want to hear about this book. And you did the most succinct pitch that I've ever heard someone do for a book. And I just sat there going, I need to read this and I need to read it now. Because who could not resist the tagline, two women, two flights, one last chance to disappear? I don't know, I wasn't sure of me. So let's start with what was the kernel of the idea that prompted you to write this fabulous book? Well, I'm really interested in people who want to disappear from their lives for whatever reason. Like, I'm, I, you know, anytime I see a book that's about like witness protection program or spies who are taking on new identities, like sign me up. I love those. And so I didn't want to write a witness protection book and I didn't want to write a spy novel, but I did want to explore this idea of whether a person can disappear in sort of our tech saturated world that we live in, right? Like, can you really, really disappear? And so we started playing around with the idea of like, well, you know, and then what would make a person want to or need to disappear, you know? So kind of exploring some of those avenues. And I played around with the idea of maybe somebody, um, disappearing around 9-11 like they were supposed to be in the World Trade Center but maybe they weren't in the World Trade Center they were somewhere else and so everybody just kind of assumed that they had died and you know a couple books came out about that use kind of using that as a premise over the years as I've just kind of thinking about this book and so I knew I needed to come up with a different idea I needed to come up with a different way for a woman to disappear and so I started thinking about you know okay well what do I actually need to have happen I need her to be able to disappear where everybody thinks she's dead, but yet there's no body. And so in what situation would somebody be presumed dead with no body? So you're thinking like maybe a shipwreck, a plane crash over water, you know? And so when I kind of latched onto the plane crash idea over water, I thought, well, but she's either on the plane or she's not on the plane, right? You're scanned onto the plane. She's on the manifest, you know, you can't not be on that plane. And so then I started kind of thinking, well, what if she's not on the plane? Is there a way that she could have led everybody to believe that she was on the plane when she wasn't on the plane? And at that point, my secondary main character, Eva, was born because I needed somebody to be on that plane in her place. I love it. So then also, so we've got one person's going to Oakland, one person's going to Puerto Rico. Was it always those two locations? And the one thing I was thinking is you got to be on the plane long enough for the other right. plane to crash. Am I right? There was a fair amount of math happening, which is not, you know, which is not what you would really think that an author is spending a lot of time doing. I knew that I wanted to set this book in Berkeley because Berkeley is just a really special place for me. And I've always wanted to set a book there. I've always wanted to go back there and write about it. I lived there for a number of years, worked at the university. So I knew Berkeley was where I wanted my character to end up. 
And so I was just kind of, you know, counting on my fingers, like, okay, well, if she starts in New York, that's like, what, like a five hour, six hour flight, depending on winds, you know, and so I would need the plane crash to happen over water. So I'm thinking, okay, well, where's somewhere kind of close over water that I'm not going to have to fiddle around with passports. That was the other thing that I was kind of trying to dodge is like, I really don't want to figure out passports. So, you know, Puerto Rico, you don't need a passport to go to Puerto Rico. So then I started, you know, kind of checking air, you know, how long does it take to fly from New York to Puerto Rico? And the math kind of worked out. And so that's sort of where I landed. So it's like, okay, we're gonna have to do here to here. It's gotta be, and yeah. everybody's on time. Those flights yeah. were on time because that was they very were. important. They were, yeah. <laughs> you wanted to be on one of your flights, not the other. So did you go up to Berkeley to do more research about like, you know, how things would happen? Because you, you'd live there, but did yeah. you go back? I did go back. Um, I went back in 2018, right before my first novel published. My family was taking a vacation up there and I just kind of detoured through Berkeley. Um, my oldest son, who's almost 16 now, was 10 at the time, 11. Um, and I dragged him all over the place. We walked to the Memorial Stadium and we walked through the campus and I walked up in the streets above where I was kind of imagining Eva's house would be and found the coffee shop where I figured Kelly probably worked. and you know, walked and sat on the bench where Claire sits that first morning that she's in Berkeley, kind of as the sun rises, thinking about, you know, overlooking the library and a large expanse. So I did spend a lot of time there kind of taking pictures and video and, you know, but really it was, it was just an excuse for me to go back and visit a place that I love. It's a place that you love, but I love it. You're taking pictures, video, and then looking back later on, I'm like, okay, how far would she have to walk? Right. There's an alleyway there. There's not. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that was just, it just refreshed my memory to be there. I didn't end up using a lot of video in, in my writing to, or the pictures really. But once I walked the campus again and got a feel for, you know, how long it would take her to get from A to B to C, um, it just, it just all came flooding back. I mean, it was like, I, it, you know, had been, you know, 25 years mm -hmm. since I lived there. Yeah. It all came like, flooding back. Sounding back right away. Yeah. How did you research them changing their tickets? Like, uh, the feasibility of that happening because everybody's like, well, how would that come off? How would they do that? Uh, I have a really good friend, John Ziegler that I grew up with, went to high school with, and he is a lot of things. Um, but he is a flight attendant for a major airline. And so he's sort of my go-to, could, could somebody do this? Could somebody do that? You know, and he, he answered a lot of my questions was like, what are, what are you doing? You know? And, um, so he was sort of my, my airline guy. Yeah. And you could see if you were that far and you switched, how would they know? It's like you're they already- wouldn't. I mean, once you're through here. security, this is what he told me. Once you're through security, they really don't ask for your ID again, you know? And when I actually went back for Winter Institute, it was one of the first times I'd flown in a long time because with two kids, I'm a single mom. It's not a lot of time to be, you know, taking vacations on an airplane. And so, you know, when I was went back for Winter Institute in January of 2020, I mean, I was like, please, God, let this work because it's too late to change it now. You know, the book's out or close to being out. It's done. Um, and yeah, once I was through security, they looked at my ticket, they looked at my ID, I could have handed my ticket to anybody and they wouldn't have, I mean, I had it on my phone, I had the QR code on my phone and they just scanned it and my name popped up and there was no picture associated with it, there was no nothing, just Julie Clark and my ticket number, yeah, or whatever, my seat assignment. Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah, and you don't really think about it. It's like, yes, that's- No, because that's who would do that? Like, who would do that? That's the insane thing, you know? I mean, nobody's gonna trade tickets. Why would you do that? Right. Yeah. Why, why would you wanna go to Oakland instead of Puerto Rico? Let's start there. Right. You know? yeah. like, what are you gonna do? Exactly. What are you gonna do? Exactly. The other thing you've got in there is this shared Google Doc that gives Claire a window into her husband's world. And I love you're adding that in. Was that something that- came to you as a way to have everybody in the loop. I mean, we shared Google Docs all the time in the office. And I'm like, whoa, this is really cool. Spying on what's going on. Yeah, um, I actually got that idea from my students. I teach fifth grade and, um, you know, they're really good at figuring out ways to do what they want to do when they're not supposed to be doing it. And so there was one day that we were working on some writing and all of my students have Chromebooks and they're all working in Google Docs and Google Classroom. And I had two kids in my class that year who were best of friends and could not sit next to each other, right? So one is in this side of the room and the other is all the way across the room, right? And I, you know, everybody's working, working away, working away on their writing and, you know, and one of the kids would type something and then the kid across the room would giggle. And I'm like, what's he laughing at? And then 
I watched him type something and then the kid's best friend giggled and I thought, hmm. And so what they don't know is that I can actually go in, I can sign in as them and watch what they're doing. <laughs> and that's what gave me the idea because I signed into one of their email, you know, I have, I mean, I'm, you know, they're, they're at school administrator, right? So I can sign in as them. And so they didn't see me in the doc. And I was just sitting there watching them talk to each other in a shared doc. And I thought before I bust them, I'm going to pay attention. I could use this. This is good. You know? <laughs> yeah. Do they get acknowledged in the book any place? No, they don't. Them? No. <laughs> they should only know. There are kids out there right now going, whoa, that's very naughty. You shouldn't do this. Yeah. It was really, this is what she was really doing at that time, you know? Yeah. Oh, bam. Yeah. Michelle's going to come on and she's got a question for us. Michelle is somebody who has joined us often at these events and we like to bring on audience members. So there's Michelle. Good to see you again. Thank you. Good to see you too, Carol. Hi, Julie. Hi. So um, I found it really refreshing that this was a book about strong women who were helping each other. Um, from Liz helping Eva to Kelly helping Claire and even Danielle. Um, so was this intentional? And did you plan that sort of as a central theme from the very beginning? And what did you write such strong female characters that were really survivors? I don't think I meant um, to write about a friendship as much as I meant to write about strong female characters. Like to me, um, I feel like in the world that we live in today, as an educator myself, as a parent, I feel a responsibility for putting strong, smart, reliable women on the page, you know? And so I didn't want to write an unreliable female narrator. I just felt like it's not really where I wanted to go. So that's really where I started. And then, you know, that whole idea of like female empowerment grew out of that, of just, you know, well, if, if I'm not writing an unreliable female, then what kind of female would I like to write? And that was, that was what I came up with. You know, women who look out for each other, women who are strong, women who maybe don't always make the best decisions, but are always willing to like step up and figure out a solution for whatever mess they've created, you know, because we all create messes. It's not like I'm writing perfect women. I'm just writing people who, when you're with them on the page, you can believe that what they're telling you is probably mostly the truth, you know, as truthful as any person can be, right? Like I had a friend tell me today, like, you know, first person narrators are often unreliable simply because we lie to ourselves all the time. You know, but but being as honest as they probably can be. And then did you want to talk about like why the like why airplanes and flight? Like why that? <laughs> you know? Just I needed I needed a way for them to intersect and cross and trade and go on their separate ways. Like, you know, people send me messages all the time about, you know, I bought this in an airport and I'm really afraid to read it. And it's like, no, 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 the, air, the plane crash happens off the page. It's very secondary. It's really just, I needed it to happen to push this story into. So it's really not, it's not about air travel. It's about a woman, both two women who are like fleeing their lives um, and their last sort of flight to get to where they need to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's also set in, set in a very short time period with flashbacks. And it's, I mean, we're moving and very like real time in a lot of ways. Yeah. Doing that, what was the challenge to write in that kind of a short timeline of what has to happen, how the action has to happen to both propel the story, but propel the action? Well, Claire needed to be in a really short timeline because the longer that she was in Berkeley, if I just let her hang out in Berkeley for weeks on end, like the tension disappears. So I really needed... I really needed her to be there for only, I think I have her there maybe like a week or a week and a half, maybe 10 days, not even that long. Um, you know, I needed her there long enough to figure out what Eva was running from and to sort of kind of get her bearings and to figure out kind of how she wants to play this, but not so long that the reader is like, nothing's happening, you know, mm -hmm. like she's not in any danger. Um, she's just hiding in a house. So I needed her doing things. As for Eva, I backed up, I think six months Mm -hmm. um before the crash and i really wanted to lead the reader more toward the the secrets that she's keeping that claire is about to figure out you know so the reader has an idea of what claire has walked into but claire does not have an idea until the, the end pretty much where she kind of figures out and finds the basement and figures out what eva's been doing um 
And, you know, I mean, I think she always had kind of an idea that, that Eva hadn't been really truthful. As soon as she gets there, she's like, this doesn't add up, Mm -hmm. but she didn't really know what she was walking into. So Mm -hmm. kind of balancing that is very tricky. And so I, I wrote them, I wrote the book straight through from beginning to end, going back and forth as, as I needed to in a first draft. And then I really just pulled all of Claire's chapters out and just revised Claire and wrote Claire and really made sure that her time period was tense and short and filled with, you know, fear. And then, then I pulled Eva out and had a little bit more room with her to sort of build, build up to what her situation is when she first kind of gets made by Agent Castro and sort of her decisions and then Liz comes into her life. And so it's sort of a balance. And so, you know, I have people who say, oh, I love Claire's chapters more and other people say I loved Eva's chapters more and it's just personal. But it's something to be able to discuss. You can either love one or the other, who's team this one, who's team that yeah. one, You're like love yeah. it. And you yeah. also hear what the reader feedback is of why, like why. Yeah. I'm sure you have an author, you've done a lot of book clubs, discussions. Do you learn something when these people are talking about the book about why they feel these ways, ways and things you I mostly learn about like things that I did that I didn't realize I did. Like in one book club, you know, somebody said, well, I should have figured it out because you wrote Eva in third person past. So of course she can't still, of course she, she can't still be alive. And I thought, well, that's not why I did that, but boy, that was really smart. You know, I mean, I didn't make that conscious decision at the time to like, well, if this is the ending for her, then I have to write her in third person because she's obviously can't be alive telling her story now. Um, and so, yeah, I didn't do that intentionally. I did. I, I wrote her in third, um, mostly just to help me differentiate between the two voices. Mm-hmm. It's a writer, good it's really hard. Yeah. Um, Arlene sent in this question. She says, Danielle, formerly Ellie, was a surprise. Did you always knew that she was going to be Claire's ally? For readers at first, she seemed to be Rory's spy on Claire. So did you know? I didn't know. And I didn't know that until after we had sold the book. Um, And my editor came back with some notes and said, you know, I'd really like one more big twist at the end. And I was like, good grief. What do you need? You know, like, really? One more? What could... And so I just started talking with, you know, a writer friend about like, okay, well, let's, let's figure this out. Let's figure this out. And there was one thing in the beginning of the book where Eva's at the airport, that very first chapter where Eva's at the airport. And it always kind of bothered me that she was just there. Like it was just sort of a coincidence that she was there. And I kind of just, "Mm, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And it just was one of those things like a, like a tag in the back of your shirt that like, you just can't really get rid of. And so as soon as Shana, my editor said she wanted one more big twist in the end, I just started thinking about Danielle. And the thing about Danielle that really bothered me in my earlier drafts is that, you know, she's not standing up for Claire. She's not like, come on, Danielle, be an ally, you know, like, who are you? What are you? What's your problem? And so then I thought, well, what if I made Danielle an ally? And then I thought, well, how, how would she, how would she do that? And so just kind of making her Claire's daughter and having, and then it tied up that, you know, scratchy tag problem where, you know, Eva's just at the airport. No, Eva's not just at the airport. Eva's there with a purpose and she had figured out sort of who Claire was and what was going on with Claire and saw an opportunity and put herself there, which solved that problem for me. It's so funny because you're actually sitting there trying to solve problems as time's going on. It's like, oh, what about this? What about that? Was yeah. there one character that was easier to write for you? Um, Claire was easier to write mostly because she's in the present time and it's very like everything in her chapter is just forward momentum was just pretty easy to just keep pushing her forward, pushing her forward. Eva was harder to write, but actually liked writing even more. Mm -hmm. Debbie Moore is going to jump on. Um, She's somebody who's been with us before and she's going to jump on with a question right now too. And I love when we solicit questions from readers to see all the things that they're coming away with. So Debbie, welcome. Good to see you again. You too, Carol. Um, Julie, I loved your book. Uh, you. You, you write about a very serious topic, powerful men taking advantage of women who for a variety of reasons find themselves to be really vulnerable. Yet you write about this topic in a very unique and non-threatening way. What did you start with? Did you start with the topic um, or the idea of, as you said before, just 
what would make somebody disappear? Or what I started disappear? with that question of what would make somebody disappear. And, you know, I, I really, and, and, and kind of around the time that I was sort of working on this book, it was the, you know, the Kavanaugh hearings and watching Dr. Blasey Ford testify in front of Congress and, you know, the kind of questions that she was being asked and, and not even that, but just like the whole Me Too era before that, where it's, you know, when, when women come forward with their stories and it's sort of like, well, what were you wearing? Well, why did you go up to his room? You know, like, what did you expect would happen? And it just sort of felt like, you know, why are you asking that question, you know? And so all of that sort of rage that I think women feel these days of just like enough, you know, um, really made me feel like I wanted to explore that. And I didn't want Claire to be a victim. I didn't want Claire to be somebody that was wringing her hands and, you know, oh, he's doing this to me. Like Claire has agency and Claire has power and she knows how to wield it in a way that works for her. Um, and she's had enough and she's figured out a way to get out. So um, that was really my whole goal was really to have that be something that Claire is really pushing forward toward and just kind of, yeah, I just wanted, I just wanted women to like have that voice in my mm -hmm. book, you know, cause I don't feel like they do, mm -hmm. you know? Thank you. And the people that were backing her were people that, or the people that were helping her, is it the Russians? Like this, you know, this, this also, this yeah. could have been an evil person, but this person was solely setting her up. And I also love the package that she was getting. She was originally supposed to go to Chicago, I think, as, as long as everything Detroit. Yeah, yeah. And she's supposed to be going there and everything is waiting. There's a new passport, $25,000, like all these things. And I love the way you thought about exactly what she would need to get someplace else and to disappear. Right. Right. And I could just picture, first of all, the way you constructed that. And then when he opened it and saw that package, what that was gonna be like, it was not gonna be a good moment for her at all. No, I mean, she really knew that at that point she needed to go and, and get somewhere else. And you know, the deal that she was making with Petra's brother, Nico, was not a good one. You know, it was not something that she wanted to do. And so I wanted, I wanted the alternative to be so scary for her to have one really scary option and then another even more scary option so that when Eva approached her, it would be like a no brainer for her to say yes. Yeah. You know? He just got to go someplace, especially since you had the tension building too, that he was going to announce his role. He was going to announce he was going to run for the candidacy, which would put her even more in the public right. eye. Right. Right. Because then it would be, you're going to go do this event. You couldn't disappear if they said, go to this city and do this event. No. You're on the radar all day and yeah. your schedule, you're here, he's there, but everybody knows where you are. Mm -hmm. So, and much yeah. more recognizable too. Yeah. Yeah. You're much more high profile than you were before. Yeah. Nancy Bader could not join us tonight, but she asked us kind of the ultimate question. Did you consider at all writing a different ending where they both get to live? Yeah, I did. And we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on it. My editor, are you sure? Are you sure? You know, this ending felt the most true to me, you know, I felt like, you know, in life, you don't always get what you want. Um, some people do have unhappy endings. And I felt like, you know, the balance of Claire getting what she wanted, and Eva not getting exactly what she wanted balanced the story a little bit more, I felt it was more believable. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, it, you, it's really hard to get off a flight that you're scammed onto, like they really don't like it. You know, and they really do most of the time check and double check and triple check. And so, you know, I knew that I would get an earful from lots of people, flight attendants mostly, saying that's not possible. You can't do that. You know, I mean, my friend John, who's a flight attendant, said, nah, yeah, you can do that. It, it could happen. But I think that, you know, circumstances needed to be just so and just right that it almost stretches like credibility, you know. And so Eva, it's sort of like, you know, she's lived a not so great life and she's made some not so great choices, but she is a good person. She is doing her best. And, you know, she wasn't doing this for Claire. She was doing this for herself. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I like to think that it was sort of her last selfless act of just, you know, this sort of will get her, get her what she needs. And the truth of the matter is if Eva had lived, she'd go off, leave Puerto Rico, go somewhere else. And, you know, you do what you know. And so there's no guarantee that Eva would go anywhere else and live a different life or a better life. She may just end up doing what she always has done. So 
We don't know that it would have guaranteed a better life for her. Would have been a great ending to have her on a beach somewhere reading a People magazine full of Claire and her, you know, resurrection, but no, I just couldn't do it. Yeah. Not going to do that. You know, as clear as the ending is in readers' minds, Mary Lou, one of our readers said, I would just like to confirm that when Claire thought she saw Eva in her pink sweater at the news conference, she was wrong and Eva died in the plane crash. And a yes. lot of people came to me and they go, did she really die? Was yeah. that really it? So I just, yeah. I thought that was a good question to come back to you with, you know? Yeah. And I think that, you know, when you really, when you're traumatized in the way that Claire is traumatized by what's happened and the guilt that she felt that Eva was on that plane um, and the desire for it to be different you know, your brain does things, you see things and view things through a lens of just wishful thinking, you know, and the fact that her seat was empty and all of these things kind of led Claire to believe. And at the end of the story, I don't know if you noticed, but at the end of the story, Claire believes that Eva got off that plane. Like mm -hmm. she knows they're not going to find her. She believes she got off and that needed to be Claire's, like Claire has to believe that in order for her to go forward and live a happy life, which is what I wanted for her. Um, she needed to think that Eva got off that plane. She had to, or she would never be able to live with herself. Well, do you know what's really funny is um, I get on planes every once in a while. I change my seat. I mean, if there's an open yeah, row, I'm going to go move. And I'm right. sitting here thinking about, oh my gosh, if we went down, they think I'm right. there. And right. there was one pipe we were on and a woman said, well, I want to go sit with my daughter. So can you move over here? And she kept buying things on the plane but she was in my seat. So they kept going, thank you, Carol. And I'm like, is this being charged to me? Like <laughs> having cocktails, yeah. she's doing all this stuff. And they go, thank you, Carol, because that's who they thought was there. And I thought, right. I was thinking of that. I was playing that through. But also if I wasn't in my seat and this, the plane went down, they think I was in the seat and I wouldn't be there. So they'd say, right. where'd she gone? What did she do? Well, I mean, you know, and that's why I needed it to happen over water is that anything can happen once the plane goes down in an ocean, you know, the tides, sharks, you know, you sink to the bottom, you, you know, get buried with sand. I don't know, but you know, it's, it's a different uh, rescue and recovery kind of procedure when a, with a, when a plane goes down in the ocean versus when a plane goes down in, you know, over land. So, you know, she wouldn't be able to have disappeared if it had gone down over land, there would have been remains mm -hmm. and there or not. Be, yeah. Or go look for. Right. Arlene also asked, I appreciate the internal dialogue of the characters, especially Eva's. How did you in, um, develop her voice? It's so achingly poignant. So what was that? Were you thinking voice the whole time? I, when I first wrote her, I wrote her in third person and nobody could connect with her at all. Like everybody who read it was like, uh, I'm not feeling Eva at all. Um, and it wasn't until I rewrote her in first person that I could get inside her head. And so I would draft by hand Eva in first person to really get in her head and what she's thinking and what she's feeling. And then when I put it into the computer, I change it back to third again. So, yeah, it's like, okay, switching. So that's how I did it, yeah. yeah. Were there challenges writing Asian cast? Because he's like on the hunt, he's on the... Yeah, no, I have a good friend who worked for the FBI and did a stint with the drug, undercover drug stuff. And so he was my go-to for that. Um, and. A lot of Agent Castro's conversation with Claire on the beach in Santa Cruz, or sorry, with, with Eva, on the beach in Santa Cruz was pulled straight from that conversation with my friend Todd, because I just said like, well, okay, here's the situation and here's this person that you're trying to get, you know, what would you say to her? And then I just waited while he, you know, and just, just yeah, <laughs> yeah. So a lot of Agent Castro's words are actually um, Todd Cusero's words. I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Um, you write the tension so well, and they've got these cliffhanger paragraphs. Is that there right from the beginning, or do you do that at the revision stage? To going a little of both, I think a little of both. Like there's, you just kind of know, sort of by instincts, where a good ending for a chapter would be, and that's where you put it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we all know. I'm going to ask the question that we all want to know because I'm seeing it coming up in the Q and A because I'm doing a little spying down there. So the question is. I hear there's another book. So you tell us about. It. I've heard the title, and it's coming June yes. 2022. Yes. So readers, we have like another year to wait, but Julie, can you tell us anything? Like I can. So it's a story of a con artist, a female con artist who sort of takes advantage of men who take advantage of people, you know? So she kind of looks for men who are not really their best self and she sees an opportunity and she sort of fleeces them. And it's the story of the investigative reporter who has been tra trailing her for about 10 years. And so 
they kind of come back together in Los Angeles. My con artist, Meg, is going to pull her last con on the man who basically ruined her childhood and her life. And uh, Kat, who's the recorder, is hot on her trail. And so the two women, as they kind of get closer together, they become friends. And, you know, then it's kind of unclear who, who, who's Meg's real target. Ooh, ooh. And it's called? It's called The Lies I Tell. The Lies I Tell. You can just picture this, folks. After reading the other book, you know exactly what we're talking about. So, um, Austin, can we go to Q and A? And if anybody does have a question, drop down to Julie that, or I'm going to keep asking. Yes, we can. Um, yeah, if anybody has a question, go to the Q and A, not the chat, uh, and I will be able to see it from there. So, the first question is from Lori, who asks, "How long did it take you to write the last play?" Um, I started the last flight in, I want to say October of 2017. Yeah. And sold it in 2019. So it took me about two years, two years from start to finish and then another year to publish it. And another during the last year, was it revisions over the last year? Was it the lot of the yeah, time? Yeah, so, so 2017, I, I drafted it pretty quickly in probably about three or four months and then rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. You know, my agent read an early draft and she's like, this is a thriller. And I'm like, this, okay. And then I had to figure out how to write a thriller. And that was really hard because my first book is not a thriller. It's just mm -hmm. an upmarket women's fiction book. And um, so I needed to kind of think about you know, the beats and the pacing and the, and the twists and the reveals and all of these things that you don't necessarily think about in the same way when you're writing straight up fiction. So um, that took a long time, it took a very long time. So I revised and revised and there was a time, I wanna say probably in mid 2018 to late 2018 that I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure I was gonna be able to pull this off. Like I just thought, I don't know that I can do this you know, and so, but luckily I just kept at it and, you know. Work from there. Finished it, yeah. And yeah. this is what you were really teaching, right? A lot of really great writing friends helped me. A lot of really great writing friends were, were really, really supportive and helpful, and that helped too. Um, was this while you were teaching? Yeah, oh yeah, it's always while I'm teaching. How did you accomplish that? Um, I wake up very early to write. And okay. so I wake up at 3.45 in the morning and write until six and then I'm done for the day pretty much unless I'm on a deadline and then I have to come home after school and do more writing and it feels like homework and I get really bitter and nasty and angry and you know, like most people do who have homework. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to get it all done before I go off to school because my brain's kind of fried at the end of the day. And I save, it's been really nice. It's, it's timed out really well for all of my books including this third one where the heavy work with my editor is happening over summer vacation. So mm -hmm. That's, you know, I'm waiting on notes right now and should have them any day. And then, you know, I'll be hard at work until, and hopefully have something mostly done by the end of summer. It's, it's really cool. interesting. A couple of weeks ago, I interviewed Linwood Barkley and he said, waiting for the notes to come back or like waiting for tests from the doctor. <laughs> and he goes like, is it cancer? Am I dying? Yeah, you spend a What's lot of time, happen? yes. You spend a lot of time going, it's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. And then you wake up in the middle of the night at three and you're like, it's not gonna be fine. It's not going to be fine. Yeah, it's a lot like that. And then you sit there and go, well, what are they not going to like? Well, I think that they're not going to like this. Well, no, I'm not sure about that. And then you have to go back to sleep because you can't, yeah. a lot of times you can't even, um, you can't even decide what they're going to write. I remember um, Alex George telling me that he had a meeting with his editor and she said, this is going to be the ending. So write to that ending. And he was like, that is the ending, but it required that rewrite to get to the ending. Yes. So yeah. And, and the thing with it, you know, you get it to a point where you can't get it any further. I had, you know, my, my writing friends read it and offer feedback. I worked with a developmental editor and, you know, she gave me feedback. And, you know, at that point, it's like, there's nothing else that I can do to it by myself. And so at that point, then it's time. Now, that's not to say that there's nothing left to do on it. There's a lot left to do on it. Um, but I just don't know what it is myself, mm -hmm. you know. But outside eye looking at it now. Yes. It's got to be somebody else. Scott Shepard uh, has a question. I don't know if you'd like to introduce him, Carol. Yeah, I want to introduce Scott. Scott Shepard is somebody who has written a book called The Last Commandment, which is coming out on July 13th. I have read this book. I absolutely love it. It's a thriller. 
I can't tell you too much about it because I we start to be giving the story away. But just know that's terrific. It's the start of a series with a new character that he's writing and it's his first thriller. And just like Julie last year, I'm like, okay, guys, this is one you're gonna wanna like take a look at. So Scott, what would Scott's question be? Yeah, so Scott asks, in plotting this clever and complicated mystery, did you have it mostly figured out when you were starting writing, like outlining first? Or did you discover a lot of the twists and turns along the way? Um, I don't really outline. I When I sit down to write, I generally have an idea of what my major turning points are. So like I kind of know what my hook is and I kind of know what my midpoint is and I kind of know what my crisis near the end is. And I always know how my book ends. Um, and the one book that I tried to write I couldn't figure out the ending and I couldn't write it. So the ending I have to know. And then I write toward that. And then, you know, as, as I go through, you know, smaller twists and smaller reveals and smaller opportunities and things that you, that you don't really think about come up. And then when I've got a draft, that's when I outline it. So I outline it after I've written a draft so that I can kind of see where all the plot lines go and all the plot holes and where they are. And you know, I mean, in the book that I'm working on right now, there's a mom in it. And like, I don't talk about the mom for like 10 chapters, you know, and it's like, that's too long. I can't not talk about the mom for 10 chapters mm. or I need to take the mom out, you know, mm -hmm. maybe she's dead, you know? So, so those kinds of things you have to, so I, so I kind of reverse outline after that. That yeah. is so smart. Yeah. And it's unlike Scott's book where it's like the 10 commandments, which I remembered none of from all like the time in Catholic school. Like you've got a part of according to that of like, you know, you've got to lay them out that way for you. It's just, they're like, Oh, how do I build the tension going along the way without those little anchors? Right. Uh, and then it sounds like that gives you something to do after the first draft so that you have direction when you're editing. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots to do after the first draft. We're not really yeah. looking for things to do for the first draft. There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot to do, but yes, it does, yes. You know, I've talked to a couple of authors recently who told me that they threw out like 25,000 words or 35,000 oh, yeah. words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just realized that wasn't the character. Like the story right. needed to evolve a different way. And right. you needed to get that far in to say, this is really where we have to go over here, folks, and let's move it that way. And yes. men can't be mean, or this can't be happening, you know? Yes. Exactly. And there's just a lot of throwing things away, mm -hmm. especially at the beginning. And then the fun part for me is after you've done all of that, like heavy lifting and, you know, hammering and, you know, the drywall goes up and then you can really start kind of decorating the book and really kind of making it and refining it and polishing it and, you know, choosing your paint colors and mm -hmm. those kinds of things I find to be a little bit more fun for me for revision, that heavy lifting with all of the, got to take this out, this chapter is trash, I don't know what's happening here and this character, no, they're gone. You know, it's hard because you see a manuscript, you generally, I generally try to have about 70,000 words for a first draft and you get to about 63,000 and you can't get beyond it because you keep taking stuff out, you mm -hmm. know, and you keep looking at your word count and you're like, I got to get to, I got to get to 70,000 and, you know, another 5,000 is gone, another 1,200 is gone and you're, you're moving in the wrong direction, but it's all work you have to do. Yeah. I remember Harwin Coben telling me once that he puts them all in the trash file, but he usually never goes back. Oh, I never throw it away. No, 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 no. I put it all down below. I work in Scrivener and there's a research binder and a draft binder. And I just, I don't ever throw anything away. Mm -mm. It's all going down in the research binder. You can sit there and go, well, I did do 35,000 words, but they're down there. They're in the research yeah. binder. They're just not yeah. here yet. And, like, which they'll, be there they'll be there and, forever. And yes, and there have been times when I thought, you know, there was a way that I said it and I can't remember how I said it. And then you go back and try to dig it up and it's never as good as you remember it, but you know, it helps to know that it's there. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Jill says, Julie, have you read any good books lately that you could recommend? I have, I have, and I always come prepared. Ooh, so uh, one of my absolute favorites was The Last Thing You Told Me by Laura Day. Loved, loved, loved that one. I read it in a day, and then I was really upset that I read it in a day because, you know, when you're reading a book, good book and you're with people that you really like being with. And I thought this ending, and I won't say anything about it, I thought this ending was perfect. I thought it was pitch perfect. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, Chandler Baker's The Husbands is coming out soon. When is it coming out? It's exchange, June. it's August 3rd. They moved August it to August 3rd. 3rd. Yeah, that's right. Mine says June. Um, this one is great. I loved this one. I thought it was so clever. 
mm -hmm. about this community that seems perfect on the surface, but it's pretty kind of scary underneath. So I would highly, highly recommend this. And this community is filled with perfect husbands, um, which we all know don't exist. So, <laughs> you know, and then I'm an old fan favorite of this one. This one came yes. out last October, Good Night Beautiful by Amy Malloy. Um, if you love twists that you don't see coming, this is your book for mm -hmm. sure. Because there is a twist in here that will blow your mind. And she does it so flawlessly and beautifully. It's really, it's something that, you know, as a writer, you want to read again and again just to see how she does it. So mm -hmm. Good Night Beautiful. And then for my regular general fiction, those are my thrillers, pretty much. But my general fiction, I just, I read this almost a year ago. Mm -hmm. And I still just think about these two characters and the life that they live and the choices that they made and how, how just beautifully written this is. So mm -hmm. Vanishing Half is my, is my last, my last recommendation. So that's what I have for you today. Have you read Falling? It's coming out on July. 7th. I haven't. It scares me. You know, people don't believe that I, uh, like, you know, somebody said something like, well, it's, it's about a plane crash. And I'm like, oh, I can't read about a plane crash. And they're <laughs> like, you wrote a book about a plane crash, but I didn't. I didn't write a book about the plane crash. I wrote about a book that happens after the plane crash. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't, I, I've heard it's fantastic, but I don't know if I have the stomach for it. It's, it's quick. It's a quick okay. read. It's another yeah. one. You're not going to fall for it very long. You're not Will falling scared? for it. scared? No, Am I be scared it, to fly? No, you're going to care about the people. You're going to okay. care about the people. But it was funny. I, I, I was reading it a couple of weeks ago and my son was coming in. He was going out to the airport and he goes, no, like seriously, <laughs> seriously, mom, like now you're reading this. And one of my bookseller friends read it on the plane flying home from someplace. And I said, just open that on the plane. And it's like, yeah, yeah no. And Sourcebooks has one similar coming out, Hostage, right? Hostage? Yeah, I don't know Hostage yet. Oh, I've got to get Hostage. Yeah. 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 I like Speaking these of flights uh somebody asked since your book came out have you come across anybody reading your book on a flight no because i haven't gone anywhere <laughs> so no. i suppose it has been the pandemic hasn't it yeah we yeah. got a pandemic in so everyone was grounded <laughs> yeah no but i look forward to that it's sold in airports so you know. but it's not like people can walk like how can i do this in the airport like there was no one able to sit there and go oh wait now what would i do how would i do this but have you talked to readers? Have you talked to a lot of readers, a lot, a lot of book groups or had a lot of conversations? Lot. Like yeah, that? I mean, it's, the, the book released a year ago yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. And I still have, I mean, I have, you know, a stretch of three or four weeks here or there where I don't really have any events, but it's been pretty, it's been pretty constant. You know, I've got one event, I've got you this week, I've got two events next week. I have four or five in July still for this book. So, you know, it's been... It's been a really good run and I still have a fair amount of, you know, people reaching out on Instagram um, that I try to respond to readers on Instagram as much as I can. Um, and it's, you know, every, every day I need to get on and, and clear out my notifications and respond to people and answer questions and message them back. And so, you know, it's definitely been an amazing experience for sure. I saw right away, as soon as people started reading it, they started writing me because I picked it as a bet song as yeah. I picked all the books that you talked about. So we have the same taste. Yeah. So it was really fun because you just sit there and see like people immediately writing, I love this book. I have to talk to you about it. And friends were calling me going, I have to talk about this book right now. And you don't get that a lot. You usually see a few people a little bit there. No, this was like, right this. Oh, it was a straight flight up, you know? Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was just a really, um... I had a really great team that helped me get it to where it, it is, you know, I mean, I came up with the idea and I did the work, but you know, my, like I said, you know, my critique partners, my writing friends, my agents, my editor, you know, it's, it's not, it's not just me. I did not do this by myself. You know, mm -hmm. I had a lot of voices chiming in saying, what about this? Try this, you know, consider this, um, give me one more twist, that kind of thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, then when it comes out too, it's the marketing of it. It's, how the cover yeah. looks. I mean, the cover here is like pitch perfect and you can tell it is because it's the same cover that's on the paperback. And a lot yeah. of times the paperback cover it's changes, but yeah. that cover was nailed right from the beginning. So they nailed it. That was the first cover they showed me too. I mean, it wasn't even, it wasn't even like go back and try this differently. It was, I you know, it was the very, very first, very first cover that they showed me. 
Yeah. And even like the positioning of the words, like every single thing on this completely works because it's telling a story. And yeah. That's important to think about. Austin, do you have more questions? Yeah, Ali asked, uh, well said, I fell in love with Liz and Ava's relationship. Did anything specific inspire you to write Liz's character? Her continued support and encouragement towards Ava was truly remarkable and inspiring. I think, you know, for, for Eva, I felt like, um, she had so little in her life go well for her and I knew how it was going to end for her. And so I needed to give her the one thing that she just craved more than anything, which was an unconditional kind of mother figure, you know, that could give her that love that she never had. She never had that. She didn't have it with Dex. She didn't have it in any relationship she had. She didn't have it in the orphanage. She didn't get it from anybody. And so I wanted to give her that with Liz. That was that was really why I wrote Liz for Eva. Um, Jen asks, what would happen to Ava's Singapore savings account? <laughs> It'll sit there and nobody will claim it because that's what happens, you know? That's what happens. So no, it's sitting there still. Yeah. What's that account number? <laughs> I know. Yeah. Ask those kids with that Google Doc. Maybe they know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and I think that happens, you know, when somebody dies and it's it's kind of an offshore account and there's nobody to kind of claim that money. I mean, you know, you hear about that with a lot of stuff that happened, you know, with World War II and, and money that was kept in Switzerland is just sitting there if some, waiting for somebody to claim it because there's nobody to show up and say, or even know about it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Mary says, um, it totally took me by surprise that Dex was really fish. Very, very clever. I wonder why he was so forgiving about the hundred missing pills. Uh, did he have the warmies for her? <laughs> um, I don't think that he had the warmies for her, but I do think that in his own way, he cared about her in as much as he could. You know, I think he was upset about the 100 pills, but at the same time, you know, I think that when you, you don't want to alienate your best producer, you know, the one that's making you a nice income that you kind of have to balance being a boss and coming down hard and like, you know, you don't want to hurt her to the point where she can't work, you know, that would not be, that's not good business. Um, and really Dex and Fish being the same person, they were originally two different people. Um, and then I had, um, my developmental editor said, you have too many people, you need to get rid of one of them, get rid of Fish. And I was like, get rid of Fish, I can't get rid of Fish. And so at that point I thought, what if they're the same person? And she just mm. is that. So when you're working with a developmental editor, are they moving like what the story is going to be, like how the story is constructed compared to a different kind of editor? Like what's developmental doing? Um, developmental is really working on pacing, working on character development. Uh, it's really, it's really just the work that I would do with my editor, but my editor doesn't always have time for multiple, you know, especially when we're on, we want to release this book in June, 2022, you know, and so, you know, an editor's first read is usually their best read mm -hmm. when they're fresh. Mm -hmm. And so you always want to kind of use as many resources as you can before you get to the actual editing of the book, you know? So my developmental editor is really more stylistic. You know, she's thinking themes, she's talking about, you know, character motivation and backstory and, you know, thinking about different ways you can deepen this. And, you know, a lot of things that my editor would probably tell me but if I can solve these problems before my editor even sees it, then my editor can do even better work, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have a developmental editor. Is there another one that you work with as well as really story development, most of all? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Story yeah. development. Yeah. Okay. And did you learn that along the way? Like you, you didn't do that with your first book or did you do that with your first I book? I did not, but I spent, well, I did kind of, I did. I worked my first book with a book coach. Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's a, and so as you're writing the third book, are you now thinking a lot of what you've learned from the developmental editor that you've yeah. got to do? Like, wait a second, can't do that. That's going to take too long. That's not going to be anything. Definitely. Yes, definitely. So, you know, you learn and you get faster as you go. I hope, I don't know. I mean, like I said, it could be a terminal, terminal disease or it could be, you know, quick in and out of the doctor. We'll see. I'm waiting yeah. on books. Yeah. One stitch or a bandaid, you know, one or the other. Austin, anything else? Yeah, one last question from CC. Why did Ava drop her purse and bend over to pick it up right before she boarded the plane to Puerto Rico? Was there any significant reason for that? 
I wanted her to pull out a line so that you wondered whether she got in. I mean, that's the author reason why I wanted her mm-hmm. to do that. So you would be like, oh, maybe she didn't get on the plane, right? Like that's her, that's why she sort of, but I think she drops her purse because she drops her purse and she bends over to pick it up because like that's all her stuff. She needs it, you know? Um, but, but yeah, I really wanted to plant that question early on in your mind. Like maybe she didn't get on the plane. You know? Yeah, maybe she didn't go do that. When you're in the classroom, are you ever thinking, like, do you ever make a note, like, on the side? Because these characters are living in your head. Yeah. You know, like, when you're making dinner with your boys, are the characters living in your head? And you're like, yeah. wait a second, she would, she would not be doing this, she'd be doing that. Yeah, all the time. I mean, and when I'm teaching, I mean, I teach reading. Reading is really my favorite thing to teach. And we study some amazing authors in fifth grade, you know. Um, and, and so when I'm reading middle grade fiction, it's the best. It's just, you learn so much about how to craft a story and they're short, you know, mm-hmm. and they pack a lot into them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you really learn how to, how to write artfully, I think. And I learned that from, you know, middle grade authors. Yeah, it's middle grade and there's middle grade and some YA that they're just yeah. so good. You're like in and out of their stories. It's- um, And it, they're so rich. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was, they were liars once they were liars. I think, and I actually bounced back onto the list because somebody did a TikTok video about it. I was like, really? Where did this Who's book come back? Author? Well, I got to remember who it was. Um, I'm spacing right now. And as my staff knows, maybe Tom can join, join in on Lockhart? that. Lockhart? Is that E. Lockhart? Yes. Yes. Basically, I yes. just read her uh, Genuine Fraud book. Yes. It was good. Really good. And I you know, just the- finished it today. There was a whole trend of everybody reading YA for a while, and I'm not seeing the same. That was before. YA. Yeah, adult. Yeah. Genuine yeah. thought is YA. I think it's YA. Tom Donatio, if you're there, can you let Austin know if it's YA? Tom Donatio is our editorial director extraordinaire, everybody. And I think it is YA. Genuine fraud. He'll he'll let us know. He's around. He'll let us know. But yeah, it's um, some of the YA books That's that I read it, through yeah. the years were like. You were in the story, like you were in there and out like that. It was so well done. Yeah. I think it's called We Were Liars. We Were Liars. Liars. We Were Liars. So well done. And you're just there at the end. You're like, wait a second, what just happened? And it's one of those, how did I completely miss what was going on in that story? Yeah. Yeah. There's a great question on topic with this. Um, She asks, why do you, or uh, what do your students think about the fact that you're a published author? I don't talk about it a lot. Like they know, (laughs) but I don't talk about it a lot. I feel like, um, I feel like my time with them, they deserve to have Julie Clark, the teacher in Mm -hmm. front of them and not Julie Clark, the author. It's a very different part of my brain that I use. And I do like to go to school and just turn all that off. You know, I love, I love, you know, sitting down on the rug and just, you know, forgetting all my author problems. Why haven't I heard back from them? Ooh, why didn't I get that review? What, what do I mean you didn't like my book? You know, all of that stuff. You just like, you know, when someone's not getting long division, like really a hundred percent of your attention needs to go to that. And it really is a lovely place to live every day for six and a half hours. So um, I don't really talk about it a lot and they don't really ask since I don't write for kids. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they don't really ask. I don't, you know, I mean, the same thing my own kids think like, oh, cool. You know, I think, you know, yeah, they just, they just think it's interesting. Like so when you I, hit have, the, I have a dog. They think that's interesting too. <laughs> <laughs> when you hit the times list, were your boys excited? Like, did they get big deal to mom? They got big deal to mom, but they didn't get like how hard it is, mm-hmm. you know? Like they, they knew that it was a big deal. Like they saw how excited I was, how excited, you know, my parents were, how excited my friends were, like everybody's so excited. Uh, but they didn't, like, I don't think, like my oldest son is taking a creative writing class this summer with, um, with Northwestern. And, you know, he's looking to, you know, be a writer. You might want to be a writer. And, you know, I'm just thinking in my head, like, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's not mm-hmm. easy. And I've been really, really lucky and had a lot of things go my way. Um, and I know equally talented authors who have worked many years longer than I have worked. I didn't even start writing seriously for publication until 2014. Um, and people have been toiling and toiling and toiling for 10, 20, 30 years and they don't hit that list. So, mm-hmm. you know, it really is, it's, it's, it's luck. It's a, fantastic team behind you a publisher that believes in your book 
and is willing to, you know, show that with, you know, the marketing dollars that you need to get it out into the people's hands that need to get it. Um, and, and, and some of it's talent, but a lot of it's just really hard work. Yeah. Um, Tom Donato did confirm we were liars and genuine fraud are both YA. Really? YA books. Yeah. So that's the reason that a lot of them, you think they're adult titles because they're written tight. You're in and out of the book, blah, blah, blah. No, they're YA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Any more questions, Austin? I see one. Diane asked, is the flight the same book as the last flight? Yes, it is. The flight is the UK version. Oh, Oh, good to know. Yeah. Yeah. They changed the title. It's like okay, let's just shorten that up. Let's shorten up the time. And then they thought it would be it would market better over there as the flight. So I was like, yeah, fine. I mean, yeah. You know, it's so interesting sometimes to see what's marketed in the UK, how they change a cover, what they'll do because they think that this yeah. is going to take it over the top and everybody's going to love it. Yeah. Because, yeah, completely different. Mm-hmm. Billy, as always, it was wonderful to see Thank you, you tonight. And I cannot wait for our readers to be able to read the lives I tell. I know I'm seeing people like making notes. You can't pre-order yet, I don't think. But no. like no. folks, mark it down because you're going to be, be able to do this. Seriously. Yeah, yeah. So. you'll hear about it. You'll hear about it soon. So Julie, thanks so much. Have a great summer of writing. Thank you. Thanks and, for having me, everyone. It's good to see you all. And to our attendees, we know many of you are going to be vacationing this summer. So this, our next Bookachino Live book group event is not going to be until late September. Um, we want to make this evening's talk available tomorrow. Thank you, Austin. It'll be available on video and podcast tomorrow. So if you missed any part of it, if you want to share with your friends, your book group, do that. Um, we'll send a note when it's up and we'll include information on how to sign up for the Book Reporter newsletter so you can stay on top of what we're doing. We're running a contest right now for the husbands on reading group guides. It's running till July 7th. So you might want to get out there and go do that if you want to win um, that with your book group. And our next event will be a Bookachino live event, one of our preview events, um, a lively talk about books that will be happening on July 14th at two o'clock in the afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Debbie and Michelle, thanks for being on stage with us and joining questions. And Julie, it's always great. Thanks everyone. Have a wonderful summer.